Thank you, Anthony, for that song service and song selection. Obviously put some thought and time into that. We appreciate that very much. The flow of thought that we had and enjoyed together as we sang songs to one another, certainly, to encourage and edify, and that we sang to our God and our Father, and ending on a solid, solid point. It is well with my soul. I want to give a little announcement, maybe a reminder to some of you that our brother Buddy Payne will be here this coming Lord's Day, this following next i got to say this right. November 6th, not this one, next Sunday, Buddy Payne's coming in from Stephenville. He's going to preach for us. I know what you're thinking. That's the top 10 sermon. Uh, he, he's not doing it. Let me just say that. <laughs> he's not going to do it. I'm going to do it, but uh, it won't be next Sunday. So we'll have to wait for that. But we are thrilled to have Buddy with us. We offer support, financial support to Buddy for the good work that he's doing there. And since I've just returned, I can say from my own eyes that uh, I was there five years ago. I think they had about 45 members, and uh, they're just over 90 now in in a five-year span. They they are growing. They're in what looks now to be a relatively small building, and they are jam-packed in there. and they are in love with one another. They're in love with God. There's some good things happening where Buddy is preaching. You'd be well served to be here and to be very attentive to the things he has to say to us next Sunday, Lord willing. Also, just by way of reminder, Wednesday night we, we gather here at 7 o'clock. And, and you would be well served to be with the brethren, to come here in a midweek service, to recharge your spiritual life, uh, to surround yourself with good people, to set that time aside, to determine now, I'm going to be at services on Wednesday because I know God's people are gathered and I know they're fighting the good fight. I want to be with them. Do that. Be with us this coming Wednesday night if it's at all possible. The lesson this morning that I have for you is the gospel of the grace of God. And I just want to say as we start that uh, there's this idea, there's a conversation that's been going on for many, many years now. Uh, Is it grace only? Am I saved by grace only? Uh, And then we we have that conversation, we work through that, and then we get to the point where we say, well, now you're saying that you got to be saved by works. And so we're not saved by works, we're saved by God's grace, and so the argument continues. But I want to say to you that in some passages I'll show you this morning, the Bible's clear that the two go hand in hand. We are saved by the grace of God. We are also saved by faithful obedience to that which the Holy Spirit has required of us. What God has given us to do, we must do in faith, knowing that we stand in that truth, and that truth grants us salvation. In Acts 20 and verse 24, Acts 20, 24, Paul says, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul has no problem tying those two things together. The gospel is of the grace of God. So we're saved by grace. Yes. The gospel is of the grace of God. I must finish the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is the truth, and the gospel is, as Paul has said, of the grace of God. In other words, the gospel is given by the grace of God. Those who take the position of salvation by grace alone are in great danger because they will typically neglect or minimize the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We are saved by the grace of God, and yet we must abide in the doctrine of Christ. 2 John 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. But he who abides in 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 the doctrine of Christ, has both the Father and the Son. I'll show you something that I saw and I thought was was interesting. It's kind of neat. The Gospel is in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12. Let's turn there. Titus 2. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The gospel is found in the grace of God. The grace of God itself teaches us 
that as we stand in the grace of God, we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We are to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So they, they do both. The gospel and the grace of God work on our behalf to help us attain and to keep salvation. The gospel of the grace of God. We are told in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, it's by grace that we have been saved, not uh, by faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul makes it clear that we are saved by the grace of God. There is no denying that. And he counters this concept or this idea that you can't work your way into heaven. It's not of works. Why? He tells us, because then men would boast. Men would use that as a tool to compare themselves by themselves, which Paul tells the Corinthians is foolish to do. But it is, it is in the saving grace that the gospel is given. The gospel, if you see that with me in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12, the gospel sits right in the middle of God's grace. They work hand in hand. They work together. So let's look at God's amazing grace and all that it does for us and all that it does on our behalf. We're told that grace has come through Jesus Christ. Let's just read it. John chapter 1 and verse 17. The introduction that John gives of God, the Word, putting on flesh. John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace came through Jesus Christ. You see what else came through Jesus Christ? Grace and truth. They both have come and been delivered by and through Jesus Christ. So, we know that grace, the grace of God, comes through Jesus Christ. We know that the grace of God teaches us. Titus 2, 11. We just, just looked at that. We are to deny ungodliness. We are to deny worldly lust. We're to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. So, the grace of God teaches us. And the truth does as well, doesn't it? Grace saves us. Look at Ephesians 2. You may already see what I'm doing here, and that is not to, not to, not to develop a counter-argument that is so strong that we move the pendulum too far the wrong way. The Lord has not done that. He's given us His grace and He's given us His truth. So to give it a fair reading, we look and see what the grace of God has clearly done by the Word of God. Ephesians 2 and verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. These things have been made possible by the grace of God. Remember in Ephesians 2, as Paul begins, he says, we once walked this way in all of the, the lewdness and lust of the flesh and according to the sway of the, the wicked one, uh, according to the way of the sons of disobedience, we were wretched sinners and God, because of his great love, he saved us by his grace. And so it's right where it's supposed to be. The Bible is clear about that. God's grace has saved us. Romans 5 tells us that we stand. And I love that. It's not just that He showered His grace upon us and we got it once and so we've, we just got it. It's that we stand in it. There's a picture here for us that's given to us in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of Jesus through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You see, the, the grace of God by the faith that we have in Him is given to us and we stand in that grace. We stand in God's protection and His covering. That He's not simply showered us with grace and then let us run off to do whatever it is we think we should do next. We stand in His grace. He's constantly being offered to us. He is our shield and our buckler. He is our tower. He is our wall. He's our banner. We stand in God's grace and we wave the banner of grace over our heads with great joy and excitement 
because He's given it to us. He's extended His grace to us. We want to be there. And Paul's not afraid. Again, we stand in His grace. You're justified by faith. You're sanctified by the will of God. You are a special, special people. He's called you out from the world. And we stand. Not in hopelessness, not, not in wonder or, or what ifs. We stand in the grace that God has extended. And it's always there. It is always with us. I love that. And God, again, has been clear to show that to us. Now we stand in grace. I mentioned we don't want to miss the other things that are said about grace and the fact that it is not, it's not God applying and fastening something to us that can't be shirked or thrown off, can't be refused, or worked contrary to. We stand in God's grace, and yet we can fall. Galatians chapter 5, and we'll just read the one verse by itself. Galatians 5, 4, you have become estranged from Christ. Now remember, Romans 5 said we were in the love of Christ. Through Christ, we have, we, have, we have the love of God shown to us. Now Paul's saying to brethren who have been converted to the gospel and have obeyed the gospel, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. What's their problem? Their problem is not that they've just refused the grace of God. Their problem is not they said, well, we heard you and we believed you at first, but now we don't believe you. This is interesting how this plays out. What's the problem for these brethren? They tried to add one more thing. We talked about it in our Bible class this morning. The, the brethren were saying, the Jewish brethren were saying, yes, Jesus Christ, absolutely. We're all for that. But Moses said you had to be circumcised. If you're a Gentile and you're not circumcised, you're not saved. Because that's the, that's the covenant that God made with Abraham, and we're the seed of Abraham. You must be circumcised. Paul says there is no such commandment in the New Testament or from God Himself in the New Testament for Christians to follow. Now, by trying to apply this extra piece, again, they're not denying the grace of God. They're still walking in truth. They're still going to church. They've added one thing. And Paul says, you're no longer Christ because you're trying to be saved by the law, which Christ nailed on the cross. It's insanity. And I think that's very interesting. That fall, you know, we say, well, you could fall from grace if, if you sin. These people are in sin, but it's not the typical way we think of it that, well, they've left the church, so they've fallen from grace. Yes. But in this sense, they're still trying to do what's right. Their motives are probably pretty clear and pretty clean, pretty pure. We think by our own judgment that you should be circumcised because it's always been commanded. It's the tie that we have with God. It's the covenant. Those things make sense. And yet Paul says, no, you've made a grave mistake. You're estranged from Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't have to argue with people about whether or not you can fall from grace. If someone shirks the requirements of God and, and refuses to be with and walk with God's people, then you are not faithfully obedient to the Word of God. You're living your life according to your own will, serving the lust of your own flesh. You're estranged from Christ. It still applies. You have fallen from grace. The grace we're supposed to stand in. To wave over our heads as a banner. I belong to God. You know, there's a beautiful thing about that. I'm, I'm a person on this earth, and I'm saying to the world around me, I belong to God. He has purchased me by His own blood. And they can take that or leave it. They, they can do whatever they want with that. But I'm saying it in great faith. I believe it with all my heart. And there is a great and awesome day coming when it will be holy and entirely and eternally true. And no one can stop it. That I've stood in this grace. I've stood in this faith. I've declared the word of the Lord. I've declared God himself to people around me because I love him and I know he loves me. And there is coming a day when those will be caught up in the air to be with Jesus Christ. And those who are not and refuse to accept the Bible, they are going to be condemned and to be tortured and burned in hell forever. Those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ Jesus is coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on them. So it's not just this idea of, well, I'm standing in His grace. It's, it's the long-term vision. It's, it's I'm looking to that day. There's a day coming when all of this will be solidified. There will be no one to object. Every knee will bow. But there will be a few who will have already bowed. That's us. There's going to be those of us who are already on our knee before Christ. He is our King. He is our Lord. We stand in His grace. 
by his power and not ours. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But we stand in the truth. The grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ are inseparable. They go hand in hand. I've talked to you about teaching us, saving us, that we stand in His grace. So let's look at this for just a moment. We stand in the grace, and if you look at the Bible and what it has to say, we also stand in the gospel. Romans 5, 2 says we stand in God's grace. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Same writer, interestingly enough. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, and in which you stand. We stand in the grace of God. We stand in the gospel. It's not an argument about works or what I've done versus what you haven't done. It is the grace of God. The grace of God that has appeared to all men, that verse has been abused for a long time. People say, it's appeared to all men, so we're all saved. That's not what that says. The grace of God which has appeared to all men teaches us the gospel. You see, they go hand in hand. They are inseparable. There's another one here I have for you. We are saved by grace and we are saved by the gospel. And you don't even have to turn anywhere. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 2 by which also you are saved. So y'all go home and don't worry about it. Is that how that verse ends? The gospel in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, unless you be estranged from Christ, unless you fall from grace. They are one and the same. I really like, I enjoy that Titus 2.11. I realize I cheated big time, you know, moving, moving those words over to get the word gospel to come out. But it's right there. And I think that, that picture, that idea, the gospel is in the grace of God. That the, that the argument doesn't need to take place that, well, we've got to figure this out. It's either one or the other. No, it's both. And the Bible is abundantly clear. We stand, brothers and sisters, in the grace of God. Romans 5.2. We stand in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. We are saved, the Bible says, by the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 2. I hope it's been made clear to all those who are here this morning that it is the gospel that saves. One of my greatest hopes, and really in all of my life, I've spent a lot of time praying that I would present a lesson in a way that someone would be convicted and and just say, I'm going to have to obey the Lord. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be condemned. I think about that all the time. I also think, with the help of brethren who have mentioned to me before, that you've got to preach as as though this is your last one. And so I try to do that. You know, if, if, uh, if this is it for me, if, if, if I go out and something happens, I lose my life. And it, that happens to people every day. I want this one to be the one. I always do. I want it to be the one. I want you to know what the Bible says. I want you to know that you have an opportunity to respond to what the Bible says, to do what's right, to be saved, to begin to walk in the light of God and to trust Him more and more each and every day of your life. I realize when I... Pray and ask the Lord to help me with those messages, to, to lay that down in a way that can be received, well-received, well-applied. That, that there's also the danger that I, that I pose. It could be that there are people who look to the man and they say, I just don't like, I just don't like what he's doing. You know, I, don't, I don't like the way he does this or that. And that, to the extent that I allow it, that plagues me because, again, the one who's saying, please come forward, is the one who's in the way because of a personal issue or something. And I think those things really happen. You know, people say, I would, but when they get a new preacher, you know, I'll, I'll come forward. Well, first of all, you had your chance last week. I am never one to tell people, wait till next week because there'll be a different preacher here. There will be, but don't wait. And don't let, do not let my pathetic 
face, life, or presentation get in the way of what God's called you to do. I should probably say that more often because I just don't, I don't ever want to be in the way. And that is, that is as heartfelt as I can possibly give that to you. There's too many people in this world without the Lord. We are greatly outnumbered as Christians. We've got to be bringing souls to Christ. We're running out of time. There may be someone here this morning who's ready. And the brethren here, the saints who worship here, with one heart, one mind, and one soul are ready to embrace you as a brother or sister in Christ, to walk with you on the path that God has given to us so that we can be right with Him, we can stand in His grace, we can stand in His salvation. If you're ready to come forward and take part in that, please do it now while we stand and sing.